Please turn with me in your Bible then to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read the Christmas story today. Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 20. Luke 2, 1 through 20. Reading God's holy word. New authorized version. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when, while Cyrenius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds lying out in the, living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your holy word. We thank you that it's a living word, that these are living truths, that they have relevance, dear Heavenly Father, for our day. We just pray now that the spirit of truth will open our eyes to these great truths that are contained in the Christmas story. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, our family took a vacation out west. And as we were on the freeway and we were in Montana, we came to Miles City. And if you've ever been west and you've been on the freeway and you've seen that, you know the scene that I'm going to portray. There's a deep valley there and as you're on the freeway you see the freeway looping off to your left and you can see it for miles and miles on end and you're just awed when you see Miles City down in the valley and you see the sky the panoramic view is just breathtaking it is so big I had a gal that worked for me once at the office and there were some foreign exchange students which came over from Japan and she said when they came to Montana, those Japanese foreign exchange students, it just took their breath away. They couldn't believe how big America was. No wonder they call Montana big sky country. When we read the Christmas story here, did you have any conception of the big sky? A panoramic view of things? Or because it was this familiar story, did you get caught up in details? Oh, I didn't quite remember that little detail or this or that. What was your first reaction in reading the story? Let's be honest. Was it ho-hum? I have to be honest as a pastor. Every year it comes to this time of year and my initial reaction is, oh, here we go again. And then I stop myself. I have to say, yes, remember the great truths that are here. It's that time of year again. I can imagine somebody sat, probably said, well, pastor read the Christmas story. Now, pastor, try and tell me something new. Do you think with thoughts like that that we impugn the gospel and our witness? If our thoughts were vocalized, would anyone, anybody really want to hear the Christmas message today? 
In meditating on the Christmas story in Luke 2, I want us to see, by God's enabling, the big picture, the big sky, as it were, the panoramic view, to grasp the big plan of God for our salvation, to lay hold of the big principles before rushing into the details. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was often asked for medical advice because before he was, of course, a pastor, he was a medical doctor. And it became so frequent that it was very time-consuming. And yet he obliged because as a physician of the soul, it became very, it became an integral part of his ministry because as a physician of the body, it expanded his ministry as a physician of the souls. There was one case particular that stands out. There were two young women that had returned from BART, which was the foremost hospital in that day, and it was located in London. And that's where Martin Lloyd-Jones had studied under Dr. Horder, the doctor to the king and the queen. It was the foremost medical establishment in London of the day. And these two young gals had returned to Wales. And as it turned out, the matron at BART's had sent the one gal with the other because the one was having a fever. Well, it was interesting. She had a normal temperature during the day, and at every night, her temperature would spike to 103 and 104 degrees. And all the local doctors got together, and they decided that what she had was an end-stage terminal tuberculosis, tubular peritonitis, tuberculosis of the bowel. And finally, what they did was when the temperature kept spiking at night and normal during the day and they were puzzled, they brought in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He diagnosed it without even looking at the two gals, at the one gal that was sick. But what he did is said, I'll go and look at her anyway and give you my diagnosis. He knew the matron at Bart's. The matron was not sympathetic. He knew something was up. And so what he did when he looked at the gal and he noticed that she had a a nice complexion and she had makeup all over her face and he never knew somebody that had terminal TB with makeup all over their face and dressed so nice and looking so fresh looking that he said, I'll make a deal with you two gals. I won't expose your story if you tell me the truth. That brought out the truth. What happened was the two gals in nursing school had had two boys in their room with him and in those days that was not something you do. And so the matron, of course, was not sympathetic, kicked them both out of nursing school and kicked them back home. And so they came up with this ruse, this story, to cover their conduct and their behavior. So what Martin Lloyd-Jones did is he went out of the room and the doctors were waiting down at the base of the stairs for him and his diagnosis. And he didn't expose this. In fact, he didn't even tell this story to his family until about 50 years later. And what he said was that the gal will have a slow recovery but she will recover completely. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says what it proved to him was the necessity of working from first principles, a practice he regarded not only as essential to medicine, but also to, theolo or to theology. Others had been misled and missed the diagnosis of the patient. Why? Because they'd failed in first principles, especially in the very first step of diagnosing, observation observation. And Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones took his cue from the Apostle Paul. Paul's method always was to work from the general principles, the big picture, before getting into the details. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that this is the correct procedure to follow because many people get into trouble in their Christian lives because they rush to the particulars. And isn't that the problem with our modern evangel evangelicalism today in the church growth movement? We rush to diagnose things and get into the felt needs, the how-tos, and we de-emphasize the doctrine, the theology, and the big picture. Just go to your local Christian bookstore and you'll see what I mean. I was in one a month or two ago, and the how-to section is tremendously large. The theological section is minuscule. It's hard to find. The details can never be understood, friends, properly unless we first grasp the general principles. The whole is greater than the parts and controls our understanding of them. The particular problems that arise in the Christian life can never 
be considered apart from the general principles. To do so is to court error, heresy, and much distress. My aim today is to meditate on the big picture, the general principles, and hopefully to give us a new sense of marvel and wonder at God's undeserved love, grace, and mercy to us as sinners in the babe of Bethlehem, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, and to heighten our worship and our praise, to give us a more settled godly perspective in the midst of our troubled times, and to give us a more passionate desire to share the gospel and proclaim Christ to others. What does Luke 2 mean to you? The first point is the pre-cross. The pre-cross. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have the creation of man. Adam was created sinless, but he was not confirmed in his sinlessness. Adam and Eve had free will. They had an equal ability to choose or not to choose to sin. In Genesis 2.17, God told them, in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. Adam and Eve sinned. The scorecard read, Eve ate, Adam two, and Satan one. Adam fell, and we fell too. He was our federal representative. And that first sin is called the fall. And the condition that originated from that is original sin. Psalm 51.5, David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We hear so much in modern evangelicalism today about free will. Free will, friends, is pure fiction. Pure fiction. You, we have bondage of the will. Every human being that is born in original sin has bondage of the will. Every human being that is born is a rational being, a reasoning being, a being that makes choices. We have free agency, but not free will. John 8, 34, Jesus says, if you commit sin, you are the bond slave of sin. And you want to guarantee that you die in your sin? Jesus says, if you believe not that I am He, you will die in your sin. John 8, 24. Romans 5, 12. Wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world and death by sin? And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But already, friends, in Genesis 3.15 is the gospel. It's called the Proto-Evangelion. It was defined as such as early as the 2nd century A.D. by the church father Irenaeus. And the Jews exegeted Genesis 3.15 as only the enmity between humans and poisonous reptiles. The Roman Catholics say the woman in Genesis 3.15 is Mary. Friends, God has a plan to save sinful man. And it's not an afterthought. In Genesis 3.21, it says this, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God performed a sacrifice. This was the first death that was ever witnessed. Here we learn that man cannot approach God except through a mediator. And the idea of substitution is already manifested. It's an effective relationship which actually secures immunity from obligation for the person for whom the substitute acts. Already in Genesis 4, the sacrificial system is seen and the idea of blood sacrifice for sin, for a sinner to be accepted by God, is already in place. And that would be echoed later in the Law of Moses. Read Leviticus 16, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law. Purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Genesis 4 already shows that mankind is divided into two classes, the Abels and the Cains. Or, if you would put it in the way of Psalm 1, there's two ways, the way of the godly and the ungodly. Genesis 15, 6, we already have the doctrine of justification by faith, which is echoed in the greatest chapter in the Bible on justification, which is Romans chapter 4. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And we need to flesh out that word believe. What does it mean? It means more than just trust. It means committal. God made a covenant with Abraham. We see that in Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant. 
echoed in Genesis 15, 16, and 17. And God gave Abraham great promises with regard to his way of redemption. And we ask, but in whom? The answer is in Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ was revealed to Abraham. In John 8, 56, Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. Galatians 3.16, now to Abraham and his seed, it's singular, and seed there in my new authorized version is capitalized. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but of one, and to your seed, capital S, singular again, and to your seed who is Christ. Friends, God spoke to Abraham about the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he did to David in Romans 4, 6 through 8, where he quotes from Psalm 32, 1 and 2, that great psalm of forgiveness. And forgiveness, and that sweet psalmist of Israel, David, cites the doctrine of justification by faith alone. David did. An act of God's free grace in which he pardons all of our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. God revealed the way of salvation in Jesus Christ in the Old Testament to Abraham and to David, who was going, and the Christ child was to come out of Abraham and David's loins. In Matthew 1, 1 through 17, we have the genealogy of Jesus, which precedes the birth story of Jesus in Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 1 reads this. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. So the question arises, how were people saved in the Old Testament? Friends, the answer is not by their animal sacrifices. That's only a foreshadowing, a foreshadowing of the substance that was to come. The answer is they were saved just like us in the New Testament. They were saved by the substitutionary penal sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, who is the substance and fulfilled the shadows. Turn with me, keep your finger there and look too, but turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Look at verses 3 and 4 of chapter 10. Hebrews 10, verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sin every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now go to chapter 9, verses 12 through 15. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. Christ entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal eternal. Inheritance. Now go back to chapter 10, verse 5, verse 5 and following. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I've come. In the volume of the book it is written to me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Friends, the Old Testament believing saints, they were saved by looking forward to the cross, whereas we are saved by looking back to the cross, which was already being stated in Jesus' birth in Luke 2 and in Matthew 1, 21. They will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What does Luke 2 mean to you? The first point is the pre-cross. The second point is the cross. The cross. 
In the eternal counsel of the Godhead, friends, the plan of redemption originated before the foundations of the world, as also the choosing of those who would be saved by the cross work of Christ. Matthew 1.21 again, they will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Ephesians 1.4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Remember, the choosing is God's electing. And as Calvin said, it bespeaks of three things. One, supremacy. Two, choice. And three, it's discriminatory. The birth of the Christ child was only a glorifying of God to those to whom it was revealed and to those whom over time would be illumined as to his salvific purposes. But to the ungodly, it was something to be despised. Note Herod in Matthew 2, 16 through 18 where he killed all of those young males aged two and under in Bethlehem, the vicinity, trying to destroy the Christ child. We as Christians have a tendency to separate the functions of the Godhead. And so what we do is belittle the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their magnificent glory in all the events of creation and redemption. Go through the events revealed in Scripture, and you'll note all three persons of the Godhead, their participation in the great events from creation to redemption, such as from the initial creation, Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it bespeaks of the Father and the Holy Spirit involved in creation. Psalm 140, 30, the Spirit involved in creation. Ephesians 3, 9, almost all things were created by Jesus Christ. To Jesus' baptism, Matthew 3, 13 through 17, you have Jesus in the water, you have the Holy Spirit coming down as the dove, and you have the Father speaking from heaven. To the resurrection in Acts 5.30, God raised up the Son. John 10, 17 and 18, Jesus laid down his life and he picks it up again. In 1 Timothy 3.16, the Spirit was vindicated in his resurrection of the Son. God sent the Son, John 3.16. The Son came, John 3.13. And the Holy Spirit empowered, John 3.34 and Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. So too with redemption. The longest sentence in the Bible, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. God authored our redemption, verses 4 through 6. The Son accomplished it, verses 7 through 12. And the Holy Spirit applied it in verses 13 and 14. And in 1, 7, in Ephesians says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. But John Gerstner reminds us that there, while there is certain aspects of the Trinity where they are all involved, they are also in those acts where one has preeminence, has preeminence as to particular functions. It's Christ's work alone, Gerstner says, that secures the ground of our justification. It's Christ alone that was the one who took upon himself flesh and blood and satisfied the demands of the law. Friends, there's no remission of sins without the shed blood of Christ, his death on the cross. And the two pillars of the gospel are the cross, which is the victory over sin, and resurrection, which is the victory over death, the universal effect of sin. And what we need to do this Christmas season is to glory in these general principles, all of the events of redemptive history, and to note that they are inseparable. The birth cannot be separated from the death, the resurrection, neither can the first advent be separated from the second advent. The great I am, the living God, who is life in himself. He's above time, and yet he operates in time. In Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it, and it shall not return unto me void. All the events of Scripture are centered in Jesus Christ, and they point to the cross and his resurrection. In Jesus' name at his birth, they'll call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. What is Jesus? It's a transliteration of the Old Testament name Joshua. Yahweh is salvation. Just think of Jesus' knowledge of his hour throughout his public ministry. Already at Cana of Galilee, he says Mary to his mother Mary, he says, woman, my hour is not yet come. In John 13, 1, Jesus said his hour had come at the beginning of that Passion Week that would end in his crucifixion, death, and burial, and then eventually his resurrection. 
The apostle or uh, John the Baptist looked at Jesus and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John 1, 29. In Revelation 13, 8, it says, The Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Friends, Jesus was born to die. Ring the bells, ring the bells, let the whole world know Christ was born in Bethlehem many years ago. Born to die that man might live, came to earth new life to give. Born of Mary, born so low many years ago. God the Father gave His Son, gave His own beloved one to this wicked sinful earth to bring mankind His love new birth. Ring the bells, ring the bells, let the whole world know Christ the Savior lives today as He did so long ago. Friends, do you see the unified wholeness of the Scriptures, the old and new? Do we humbly acknowledge that the baby in the manger was born to die for your sins and for mine? And that that moniker, born to die, could have been written in red letters above his manger? And we in our sins put him, the very Son of God there, in such a lowly, humble state, and on course to the cross. From the manger to the cross to eventually before his throne, may we ever bow the knee and shed tears of gratitude. What does Luke 2 mean to you? The first point was the pre-cross. The second point is the cross. The third point is the post-cross. The post-cross. We are saved by looking back to the birth and the cross work of Jesus Christ. Why do we include the birth with the cross? Because, friends, we're saved by the twofold obedience of Christ. First of all, we're saved by His active, active, perfect obedience to God's law. From His youth to the cross. Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the, the, the gospel. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 1 John 3, 4. He who commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. And we're also saved by his, secondly, by his voluntary, his passive obedience in going to die on a cross. Question arises, why is the cross the greatest display of God's love? The answer, friends, is because it's the giving of God's best at the greatest cost to the least deserving. Let me repeat that. It's the giving of God's best at the greatest cost to the least deserving. Friends, just as our consumer-oriented society has turned Christmas into a bright ornament, so modern, evangelical, modern evangelicalism has turned the cross into a bright ornament to be worn around people's necks. May God prevent us who name the name of Christ from being caught up in the glitz and may we be humbled by the humiliation of our, that our Savior endured in both His birth and in His resurrection, in, in His death before His resurrection. The question arises, how should we look at the past? Friends, Christianity is an historic religion. Christianity is based on facts. It is the one religion of the world that is an historic religion entirely based on facts. The gospel and the church are grounded in history. We live in the power of the historic acts of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not nostalgia by looking to the founding events of Christ's saving work, and it's not living in the past, and that's what identifies us. God forbid. But what we do is we realize that God, who planned all these events, is a living God. He has life in himself. John 5, 26. And he has revealed himself in the redemptive historic acts. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. In Mark 12, 26 and 27. He lives in us. So you and I as living stones are the chief cornerstone. Our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're to live in the power of these past events in our day and age right now today. Colossians 1.13, he's translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the living, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, do we live in light of the living, 
life, transforming Holy Spirit power of the inspired general principles of our faith? Or do we just profess a good name and say, pass me some more tinsel? Remember, to the world of the ungodly all around us, all of this sin talk, the need of a Savior, so he came to be born in a manger and die on a cross, it is offensive. So our challenge is what do we say and do in light of the offense of the birth and cross of Jesus Christ? 1 John 3, 1 through 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, and such we are. Therefore the world knows us not because he knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not appear we shall be. We know when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every one who has his hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And may we remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 14. The world is crucified unto me. Why? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. What does Luke 2 mean to you? We looked at three points this morning. We looked at the pre-cross, we looked at the cross, and we looked at the post-cross. Friends, has this meditation on the big principles related to the Christmas story in Luke 2 provoked any sense of wonder residing in our being? Has it given us a renewed appreciation and humble thanks to God in Christ for all that he's done for us? If not, we need to examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, whether we are in the faith. We also need a rebuke from Martin Luther. Martin Luther dressed down his humanist opponent, Erasmus, by saying this, The trouble with Erasmus is that he is not stupefied with wonder at the child. He beholds this wonder as a calf staring at a new door. The deficiency of faith is made evident by a lack of wonder. Let me repeat that last sentence. The deficiency of faith is made evident by a lack of wonder. I challenge each of us this Christmas season to rediscover these great truths of the birth of Christ and also to rediscover that young child that is still there within us all. Ravi Zacharias told the story of telling a bedtime story to his children. He had three children. One was in junior high, one was in grade school, and one was preschool. And as he told this story about this dimly lit house and about going up to a doorknob and a door and going into the bedroom and heading for something that was hidden under the bed, he said his junior higher had a tough time working up any sense of wonder or marvel at all, even when they were right before he was going to reach under the bed for what was ever underneath there. The child who was the great schooler, the sense of wonder began to heighten when they got into the room before they ever got to the bed and to find out what was under the bed. But he said his preschool child, the sense of wonder was already there in his eyes and in his demeanor when he was just reaching for the doorknob on the door before he ever got in the room. And friends, that's what we need to recover, each one of us, as we look at the great truths that are in the gospel story here in Luke 2. Do we need a renewed sense of God's living presence in this historical event at Bethlehem, as well as his abiding with us this Christmas season? The event in Bethlehem's manger occurred over 2,000 years ago as a historic fact, as foreordained by the living God. And friends, that revelation lives on today in principle and effect. Do you agree? J. Gresham Machen in his great book, What is Faith, said this, If a man's knowledge of God removes his sense of wonder in the presence of the Infinite One, he shows thereby that he has hardly begun to have any true knowledge at all. Friends, that knowledge must include a biblical definition of sin. A biblical definition of sin. 1 John 3, 4. He who transgresses the law commits sin, for sin is a transgression of the law. As John Piper says, it's any attitude, action, or desire that explicitly breaks a commandment of God is done from a heart of unbelief or does not give glory to God. 
friends, there's no comprehension of the love, the grace, the mercy of God to us this Christmas season or ever without a true comprehension of what sin is. Our sinfulness, the heinousness of that sin to God and the just punishment it deserves, eternal death. Just before Jesus' ascension into heaven, in Luke 24, 46 and 47, he gives the apostles their mandate. He says this, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Friends, remember, it's only by the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins, God's gracious discharge of a believing penitent sinner from the guilt of all his sins for Jesus' sake. It cannot be canceled by repentance, works, or even regeneration. It's only through forgiveness that our sins can be canceled. The biblical condemnation of sin, the blotting out of sins, can only be through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. David knew that in Psalm 51, in verse 1, he says, Block out my transgressions. In verse 9, he says, Blot out my iniquity. Wipe the slate clean from your books, God. In Psalm 32, the psalm of forgiveness, in verses 1 and 2, that sweet psalmist of Israel, extolled justification by faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone. It was during December of 1926 that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preached a sermon in Welsh on Luke 2, 18. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says that his theme was the wonder and amazement that are inherent in the gospel message and our tragic failure to appreciate this. He went on to say this, if we could but see the real wonder in the incarnation, the crucifixion and the resurrection, what powers should we be? The Son of God coming to die for us, to save His people from their sins, how can we remain so silent and so passive? Friends, God's Spirit is still speaking and convicting today. How can we as forgiven sinners through Christ's cross work remain so lacking in wonder and amazement at God's undeserved love grace to us in the incarnation at Bethlehem? How indeed can we remain so silent and so passive? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I just thank you for your word of truth. I thank you for the spirit of truth. May we always remember the word of God alone will dry up. The spirit of God alone will blow up. The word of God and the spirit of God together will grow up. And I pray, dear Holy Father, for a convicting of your spirit, of the truth that is in the Christmas story. These great doctrinal truths that are all there, dear Holy Father. And I pray that we'd have a sense of marvel and wonder, amazement at your undeserved love, grace, and mercy to us. May this Christmas season, may these truths become fresh to us, new to us, as if we were a young child staring at that doorknob at that door. And I pray, dear Holy Father, that that marvel, wonder, amazement that God would save sinners such as us would be in our hearts on our lips, and on our faces as we live and move and have our being before a watching on God.